Okay, well, good afternoon. Um, friends, my name is AJ Glauber. I am a environmental specialist at the World Bank here in Jakarta. I run our landscapes program, uh, which attempts to support the government of Indonesia in reducing emissions, uh, deforestation, and improving land management. And I have the honor of being here today with an incredible group of colleagues working on different aspects of land management uh, from different sectors. Um, so maybe I can start a bit with a, a little bit of background and then introduce our, our colleagues. We know from downstairs what we heard this morning is the serious importance of the agenda on land management and land restoration. We know that there are ambitious global restoration goals that have been announced through Bond Challenge and other fora that have set to reach 150 million hectares of, of, um, of, of restoration by 2020, which would require close to $40 billion a year in investments, the global scale. It's a lot of money. <laughs> in Indonesia, Indonesia is a, part, a big part of that, as you may know. Uh, two thirds of the emissions in Indonesia come from the land use sector and there are an estimated $80 billion needed to rehabilitate forests alone in Indonesia. Um, so quite, quite a lot. Uh, we know that the costs of poorly managed land in Indonesia are also quite significant. I think many of you have a copy of the paper that was done by uh, World Bank with many of the people in the room last year. Cost of fire, which showed that uh, in 2015, the costs to Indonesia alone from the forest and land fires between August and October cost $16.1 billion, 2% of GDP, twice the cost of recovery from the Aceh tsunami. Uh, just in costs to Indonesia, cost to livelihoods, to tra lost transportation, healthcare, et cetera. So these are big numbers, and we also know that the government of Indonesia has very ambitious targets for restoration, and they have estimated that it will cost close to $2 billion just for restoration of the 2 million hectares that are on the table uh, that BRG uh, with Pat Nazir's broad leadership are attempting to make. So these are big numbers, very important globally, important in Indonesia, but also a, a really serious challenge to, to make happen. So with that said, maybe I want to talk a little bit about who we have here to help us understand what it will take to raise money uh, and use the existing funds that are out there in a way that has maximum impact for restoration of Indonesia's landscapes. And I am, uh, I am lucky to have, I'm going to start to my, to my left right here, I have pa August Pernomo, who is the Managing Director for sustainability and strategic stakeholder engagement from Golden Agri Resources. Uh, this is, as many of you know, this is one of the larger uh, uh, um, firms in, in Indonesia and beyond, working a lot in, in oil palm. Um, and his role is to plan and oversee the sustainability strategy. Uh, and that includes working across the value chain of their palm oil commitments. And he's, before that, he brings a lot of experience from a variety of sectors. He worked as the special assistant to the president of Indonesia for climate change from two, 2010 to 2014. Before that, he was a special assistant to the Ministry of Environment. Um, before that, he worked at the World Bank. Yay. <laughs> Sorry, we didn't know long. <laughs> he was also the executive director for WWF Indonesia. Uh, and he comes with a master's in environmental conservation policy from Tufts, as well as an MBA from Pasetja Mulia Management Institute here in Indonesia. Thank you very much for coming. We also, next to him, have Pakindi Rinaldi Sia here, who is the deputy director for climate finance and international policy from the Ministry of Finance. Um, he has worked on climate finance and international policies for the last several years focusing on a portfolio on climate resilient development finance. Before that, he worked as the deputy director for macroeconomic surveillance and head of the SOE revenue policy. And before that, had 18 years of experience in the private sector and with a number of countries, including Mattel, Telkom Indonesia, et cetera. He has a very interesting background, a BA in physics from Bandung Institute of Technology and also in manufacturing engineering. So quite a, um, a diverse background, as well as an MA in accounting and finance and economics from the University of Sydney and a PhD in economics 
um, as well. So we have a quite impressive background. Next is Ernest Beth, Principal Operations Officer from the International Finance Corporation, currently based in Singapore, but has spent uh, something like 10 years before that based here in Indonesia. He has been working on agribusiness development across the board, has a lot of experience, particularly in oil palm development in the region. He's also working in Indonesia, Mongolia, South Asia, big focus on supply chain finance for smallholders. Um, and he comes with a bachelor's in finance, as well as English and American literature, so you feel free to ask him about other aspects of, <laughs> of, of that life, and also a master's in corporate science. science. Next, oh, here, I'm sorry, I'm putting these in order. We have Christopher Grunstadt, who is a counselor in environment and climate change at the Royal Norwegian Embassy here in Jakarta. And he has worked there as a, as a and prior to that, at the Norwegian Environmental Agency as a senior advisor in the climate department. Coordinated their bilateral with Brazil, South Africa, India, and China. Worked on aspects related to their engagement with the IPCC. He was part of the Norwegian team that uh, was involved in the climate negotiations leading up to the Paris Agreement uh, and has a background in law and communications. So thank you. And last but certainly not least, we have pa Erwin Widodo, the Regional Southeast Asia Coordinator of the Tropical Forest Alliance 2020. He brings a scientist with over 20 years of research in tropical ecology and forest management, has worked for a number of different agencies throughout Asia, in working on conservation and advocacy, including ICCTF, WWF, CI, the Wildlife Conservation Society, Nature Conservancy, etc. cetera. Um, and now at TFA 2020, he's working on spatial planning, conservation management, sector reform, and sustainable financing. So broad set of issues. He brings a bachelor's in biology, a degree in global policy and diplomacy uh, from Georgetown University to PhD in bioresources production and energy sciences from Kobe University. So I think you'll agree, I think we have a strong panel here that we're going to hear a lot from. And I'm, I've asked them all to start by introducing themselves a little bit about what their role is currently in providing finance around land management, restoration, etc. So with that, let me pass my the microphone to my left. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on my daily activity, I'm overseeing the sustainability aspects of about 500,000 hectares of palm oil uh, planted areas throughout Indonesia. And one of it is to work out the conservation area that we will commit additionally uh, on top of the 70 thousand hectares of HCV and HCS that we have already set aside. Uh, we also need to put, uh, we are planning to put about 10,000 hectare additional conservation area in uh, re relation to the LUC compensation, compensation that we have to make for the RSPO uh, criteria. So we are looking and talking right now with several institutions, several partners, and hopefully within the next few months, we'll be able to make the announcement of that. On top of that, I'm also in the board of Blantara Foundations, which we have two board members also in the room who already got a commitment of $10 million to spend on various landscape approaches. Uh, what else? I think that's all. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about how can companies uh, contribute to the financing, what are things that are uh, interested and possible for the companies to do uh, in the next few minutes. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Director, AJ. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here with you uh, today. Uh, my name is Kindi, I'm from Minister of Finance, I'm the Deputy Director for Climate Finance. Uh, all this time, we've been actively negotiating at the UNFCCC's, uh, including the recent Paris Agreement, uh, where we also uh, pledge our commitment for the NDCs to uh, reduce the emission from the greenhouse gases uh, by uh, 2020 by as much as 29% unilaterally and 41% uh, multilaterally. 
Well, in that regard, I think uh, the governments also have strategy uh, that is embodied by the, uh, in the uh, NDCs, for which 17% 70, of the uh, reduction of the greenhouse uh, gases will be uh, sourced from the uh, agriculture, forestry, and land use, including the peatland, of course, one of the most uh, intense uh, high carbon stock. Then, uh, with that regards, I think uh, I would really uh, love to talk about uh, how the uh, budget can be strategized to provide the maybe still fundings to do so, and also including some of the uh, what I call the uh, necessary and the uh, conditionalities needed to mobilize finance for peatlands and and and, and etc. So I think with with, with due time, I will uh, uh, explore that with you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ernest Beth. I'm with uh, IFC. Um, many of you will know uh, the World Bank Group as the World Bank, but within the World Bank Group is the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, and we work with the private sector. Um, we primarily invest in companies, we invest in banks, we invest in PPPs with infrastructure. We advise governments on private sector issues. We don't lend money to, to governments. That's what the World Bank does. We don't advise governments in a range of, of issues. That's what the World Bank does. Our, our role is really just with the private sector. Um, the whole World Bank group was under a moratorium on palm oil investment several years ago. And uh, uh, as we came out of that moratorium and we went through a number of stakeholder uh, engagements around the world, several here in Indonesia, what we heard from stakeholders was IFC, one of the roles that you could play is, is helping smallholders um, in this palm oil space. And in some countries that was uh, uh, maybe a plasma scheme, but particularly in Indonesia, what people were telling us was, tell us what a smallholder looks like. You know, what is a smallholder? Because we hear from government, it's this. We hear from industry, it's this. We hear from smallholders, it's this. And particularly tell us what an independent smallholder is and tell us what the gaps are. Um, once we came out of the moratorium in 2011, um, one of the first things we did was we looked at what is a smallholder? What is an independent smallholder in Indonesia? And a good answer came up that there is no one definition. But uh, what we did put together was this book, and this book's available on our website, and it is a diagnostic study on Indonesia oil palm smallholders. And we went out and we surveyed about a thousand smallholders around Indonesia to find out the gaps that they had in their production, uh, to find out the, the challenges that they were facing. And from there, what we began was a program focused on independent smallholders primarily in Indonesia. And the work that we're doing with independent smallholders is seeking to link them into private sector supply chains, to link them into companies that, that are committed to sustainable palm oil production, that are committed to investing in the supply chain from smallholders. In the area of agricultural finance and smallholder finance, what we're looking at is how can we use private sector instruments to reach smallholders? Now, um, We've looked at a number of different uh, sectors. We've worked with banks. We've worked not just with oil palm. Um, we've got a number of lessons from those other sectors to bring into oil palm. Um, but our observations, and we'll get to these later, is that it's, it's hard, you know, incredibly hard to link smallholders, especially independent smallholders, into the resources that are out there. There's an abundance of resources that could flow to smallholders for sustainable production. The challenge is, is getting that to them, those mechanisms to get it to them, and then to be repaid from that, from whomever's living the money. So I hope that that's what we can talk about as we go forward here. Thank you. Thank you very much, AJ, uh, and thank you to our friends at C4 for hosting us here today. It's, it's an honor for the Norwegian Embassy to be allowed to be part in such a uh, knowledgeable panel. My name is Christopher. Um, I joined the Norwegian Embassy nine months ago. Um, so th Indonesia still feels relatively new to me, but uh, uh, Norway has been working with Indonesia for, for quite some time. And um, well, 
let me also say thank you to all of you for coming here because I think it's quite impressive that so many people uh, are spending their afternoon to to discuss peat and uh, and and climate finance. Um, we have been working with Indonesia since uh, 2010, but I, w I would actually like to go three years before that, in 2007, actually also here in Indonesia, the, Norway, the Norwegian government launched Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative. And the background for that was that a, a number of civil society organizations in Norway convinced our Prime Minister, our Minister of Finance and our Minister of Environment that if we really wanted to make a huge push on the global agenda to curb climate change, we had to do something about forests and, and, and land use. Um, so at COP13 in Bali, uh, the government launched this initiative. Uh, it has several goals. One of them was to ensure that, uh, that RED would become part of a future climate agreement. That goal was achieved in Paris. Another goal is to work with other donors um, and with forest countries to, to curb emissions, to establish uh, bilateral partnerships and find innovative resource-based ways to, to support countries that are managing to, to reduce the emissions from, from the land use sector. Uh, our cooperation with Indonesia started uh, with a letter of intent signed in 2010. I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience, so this, uh, many of you know all about this from before, so I'll try to be short. Um, we are aiming, we pledged 1 billion US dollars in the period up to 2020. Uh, 800 millions are uh, informally reserved for results-based payments. Uh, and day by day, we are seeing hard work by our colleagues in the Ministry of Environment and Forestry and by the Ministry of Finance and also on the province level here in Indonesia to get closer to the phase where we are able to reward emission reductions with, with actual payments. Um, we, some people ask me quite often, aren't you impatient? It's been seven years since the letter of intent was signed. Yes, we are somewhat impatient. We have people at home who are impatient. At the same time, we have been doing this for a while. We have been working with Brazil and we know that this is an operation that takes time. So I hope that my contribution here today can be uh, sharing a little bit about how we as a donor see that we can support. Uh, there are limits for what we can support, but to be flexible, so we're, we're trying to find solutions, and I hope that uh, we can share how we think about this today. Good afternoon, I'm Erwin Widodo. I'm from Tropical Forest Alliance, uh, the good customer uh, forums proposing these um, project activities uh, hosted by the World Economic Forum in Geneva. In Indonesia, we are administratively attached to the Indonesian Business Council uh, Indonesian Business Council for Sustainable Development. Our programs are mostly to proposing and then encouraging and also to bridging between the governments, uh, companies, and also the social, uh, civil society, and also the, uh, the communities uh, to work more into the zero deforestation and reduce emissions in any level of the global uh, national or also in the sub-national level. So um, our work mostly to support the facilitations activity related to the sustainable uh, and innovations uh, financing and then also to support the smallholders and also the independent holders in the company and in the same time we also supporting the systems and the government regulations so that uh, it can become a very good umbrella to support the process of zero deforestation. And also, we also working on the uh, mechanism of the uh, pit restoration uh, agencies in the sub-national level, even into the sub-sub-sub-national level, if possible. But the most important things that we are uh, doing, actually, to make sure that the men in the right place not in the wrong place, <laughs> to be able to invest into our country because we believe that the most potential uh, discussions that we will have today is how they can contribute to our system. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I think one of the, the major questions for this panel is really about, it's about money, right? It's about finding money, using money differently, more effectively, blending finance, etc. in a way that actually 
gets the money to where we want it to be, which is in the hands of the people making decisions about land use and land management, right? So I wonder if I could start maybe a little bit with, with you about Kindy, understanding a bit about where government, Ministry of Finance in particular, sits. What's the, I mean, we understand from some of the work that's done by BRG that they have this approximate, one, I think 1.7 billion is their current estimate for what it takes to get to 2.4 million hectares of restoration. There's something like a billion dollars in theory that's coming from your pockets. <laughs> so it'd be interesting to hear a little bit about kind of what is the vision from Ministry of Finance side? Where, what are the sources of revenues? What are the kind of instruments that are being considered to raise that money? Um, yeah, and what, what's, what's currently being done? Thanks. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, AJ. Um, well, um, the Ministry of Finance has been uh, working in optimizing the uh, budget allocation towards uh, achieving the uh, national determined contributions. And I think uh, part of it already been uh, very obvious within the budget. Like, uh, for instance, uh, in terms of the um, agriculture. The agriculture, there are subsidies that have been uh, optimized, like for instance, the fertilizer subsidy. Now, with the smart uh, agriculture practices that we have been developing part of it with the UNDP, for instance, uh, they've already been able to save up about uh, one third of the uh, subsidy. And if, if we could somehow apply these uh, smart agriculture practices uh, nationally, then um, I'm very optimistic that we can even save more, yeah, after maybe about half of the, of the uh, subsidy, which we can uh, duly uh, reallocate to the reforestation and the peatland restorations. Uh, the amount now is about 14 trillion uh, rupiah. And uh, part of it, there are also ways that we have uh, been developing across the ministries. Uh, I don't know, maybe some of you have been involved with the uh, drafting of the so-called uh, regulation for the uh, 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 economic instruments for, in, for environments. Uh, one of the important aspects for fiscal here is the uh, payment for ecosystem services. Uh, when this uh, regulation ready, then we can uh, apply uh, the payment for ecosystem services for inter-regional government transfers. Well, with this uh, way, then the, the, the regions or the province that do the conservation and reforestation and other land uh, management will be uh, able to get support from those who are doing otherwise. This is, I think, ways to really mobilize the, uh, the, the uh, uh, financing that we need for the uh, climate and the, uh, and the land uh, use management. And also, uh, there are uh, other ways, like for instance, the green sukuk, yeah. Green sukuk. Sukuk is, uh, I think, is naturally been green yeah, because it is a uh, Sariah based compliance. It can be uh, uh, mess like what we call as the uh, earmark yeah, towards the uh, project, so it can be directly uh, uh, project related. This is in contrast to the bonds uh, in the uh, law of the uh, Surat uh, Utang Negara, the, the, the uh, state bonds. For the state bonds, we can only uh, finance the deficit, uh, fiscal deficit, but for the uh, Sukuk, we can uh, specify the project. Like for instance, with, with, uh, I think I would also uh, like to refer to the, the so-called uh, innovative uh, financing yeah, uh, that remind me of the uh, immunization bonds uh, back in, the, uh, in Africa by the, uh, the CDG. Where uh, back then, the, uh, the, the result out of the program that was valu uh, valuations, where the valuation then used to uh, as the payment for the coupon, while the principal, of course, will be restored from the from the program itself. This way, I think, is also one of the uh, uh, great and I think uh, require a short term uh, uh, ways to mobilize finance that we need uh, in terms of the, uh, f uh, for instance. Uh, the 2,000 uh, uh, hectares, that, sorry, the 2 million hectares uh, of the peatland uh, program by the BRG. And I think there are other ways that I think uh, we also need cooperation with the uh, uh, privates and also with the markets. But I think uh, out of this uh, land uh, use and land management, 
There are three, uh, I said, the conditionality or the, uh, the sufficient conditions that need to be there and need to be agreed upon. First is the landscape. I think for the landscape, we already got some of the presidential decrees for this. Like for instance, the uh, presidential decree number 13, year 2012, on the uh, 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 special uh, uh, management of the Sumatra Island, Tata Ruang uh, Pulau Sumatra, where we have like five corridors of the forest that are already been uh, uh, specified there. And also the Borneo uh, corridor as well. That's one landscape. And second uh, is on the uh, accounting for the, for the result. Like for instance, we're gonna be a carbon uh, result accounting or any other uh, means like for instance, in the immunization in terms of the uh, children saved out of the uh, folio back then in Africa. But if we take into account the carbon accounting, uh, the Indonesian uh, national standard, the SNI already got the, the allot matrix method, yeah, standard of it. But I think it's uh, very, very uh, uh, complicated because it needs to uh, measure like every single uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the trees. But there are other ways, like for instance, the high carbon uh, stock uh, methods, which I think uh, I see some of the uh, uh, founding uh, members here in the, in the room, like for instance, Ibu Aida. I think there are ways maybe we can somehow take into account this method for that accounting uh, uh, methods, yeah. And the last but not least is the MRV, the monitoring, reporting, and verifications. How you will uh, uh, value all this altogether, given the methods developed in the carbon accounting. So I think if we could somehow agree, like what Pa Erwin says, maybe out of the governments, donors, and a multilateral agency, as well as the private and market, uh, can agree on the three of these. I think that would be great ways to mobilize uh, finance for the uh, land use and land use management. Back to you, Aiki. Thank you. Thank you. So it's, I mean, it's quite interesting. I think this point about recognizing that there is a tremendous amount of spending going on, right? There's a lot of money. Government is spending a tremendous amount of money in encouraging development um, that has both positive and negative outcomes and trying to understand really how to start to redirect that to have more efficient um, and effective outcomes at the landscape level. I think that's certainly something that would be interesting to kind of drill down into a little bit with some of our, our panelists here. Um, so, Bagus, I think what you mentioned up front is really, I, I mean, uh, quite fascinating. I know that there's a lot of um, expectation that the private sector will be, I don't know, the knight in shining armor <laughs> when it comes to providing the financing and the technical really, really, really the force behind landscape restoration at scale in Indonesia. Um, can you talk a little bit about, in your view, what really is the role of the private sector in financing this kind of land, sustainable land management and restoration in particular? Um, and what do you think would be needed to really scale that up uh, in, a, in a meaningful way? Thanks. Well, there are, in general, two types of financing. Uh, to be done by the private sector. One is that relates to philanthropy, uh, donation types of support, which exist, but a company cannot give too much on donation because they have to first ensure that they can continue doing business. And the problem with the uh, philanthropic donations, there are other causes that also in competition to get the money. Uh, AIDS, uh, tuberculosis, and others are all looking for this philanthropic. So it's there, uh, the pie is not that big, and it's in high competition. Now let, let me move to the second part, which is uh, a support that is more of an investment by the company, which means it has to be a part of their core business, or at least an investment that they are expecting return. So the question on this pit restorations is what's in it for the company. And when we talk about investment, the, the one that, that is also important aside from the rate of return is also on the delivery, the timing. And on the timing, we have problems in participating in the scheme like RADD, not only because it took seven years for Brazil, for example, but also here in Indonesia, it took many years to agree on a baseline. So if we have difficulty and continue debate on baseline, then there will be many more years before a scheme 
can be operational. So I think we need to find a way that it can be quick, it can be certain, it give a relatively low risk for the investor to make. Please don't forget that banks and also government are very stringent in terms of minimizing risk. So we, we don't have uh, the liberty to invest in all kinds of risky things. Our shareholder, uh, the central bank and everybody is looking into how we manage the investment on the issue of risk. Uh, this is something that perhaps we need to go a bit out of the box. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the rooftop solar panel. It's a very simple thing to do. You install the solar panel, you bring the meter, the electricity meters that can take notes both the in and out of the electricity. And then you know at the end you have certain amount of savings from your investment on your electricity bills. That is a very straightforward. It's only 5,000 per house at the most. Well, if you are, have a, a mansion, you probably need 10,000, but a normal middle class housing is about $5,000 that you can get in three to four years time. With that, you can get 1,000 people in big cities to contribute, and that is $50 million, for example. Not much to take except the gadget which is available and the policy that the government allow for uh, feed-in tariff. H how can we do that in terms of peatland? If you're talking about 400,000 hectares of peatland, of course that is a very cumbersome meters of whatever we're going to measure. So we need to break it down into smaller size that you can manage what you are putting in and what you will get out of it. The scientists are here, and we need them to go also a bit out of the box. What would be the indicator of input and output that they think is doable as an approach to release the financing that is there, a big part. Just to mention that on, on the CPO funds, we contribute, uh, the, the companies contributed through the scheme about, what is it, uh, 1.1 trillion to 1.2 trillion a month. So it's about a billion dollar uh, or more uh, a year, a billion and a half. That is possible, and, and the private sector is doing it uh, gladly uh, because they know the money will also coming back to them in terms of subsidy for biodiesel. So the, there are macroeconomic innovations that is needed, and I'm glad Pak Kindi is here. But there may be some different ways of managing peatland at the smaller scale level where we can measure input and output quicker, reliable, that we can then attach to financing from various sectors. Uh, if, if, gov if the company need to put money for maintaining the water level, for example, uh, at 40 centimeter uh, below surface or 50 or 60, whatever, and then after a while, they could probably get an incentive from the government uh, in doing that. And so we can do the, the mathematics and the market will be able to measure the risk and the, the advantage of doing it. Ernest, you. I'm interested to hear what you, what you, what you think about this. What are, in your mind, what do you think are the, the sort of the key, um, how do I say, the key the key challenges to really raising finance and transferring finance to smallholders in particular. I'd be really interested in hearing that. And how does that, you know, let, let, let's start with the experience that you guys have and see what has been the, the biggest challenge to really bring that partner to the table. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks, AJ. Um, okay, so <laughs> some of the challenges. Um, l let me begin where we are. And uh, where we are is we're, we're, we're in a country where Farmers, independent uh, smallholders especially, have a hard time getting reliable finance for simple things like inputs for agricultural. I mean, for them to uh, uh, have access to longer term capital, say for replanting or for peatlands restoration, that's, that's a ways off. I mean, right now, farmers that we work with have a hard time getting the, the, the working capital that they need for the right kind of inputs at the right time delivered to where they need them. 
And that's where we've focused a lot of our time. And, uh, uh, you know, projects that I've managed have made every mistake there is. So uh, if nothing else, we've learned a lot from the mistakes we've met, uh, that we've made. When we look at palm oil and we look at a few other commodities in this country, you know, there's some good characteristics about them. There's frequent repayment, there's good offtake, um, um, there's reliable offtakers, not just good offtake, but reliable offtakers. There's chances to uh, improve quality. But what we don't find is banks appreciating the opportunity there, the opportunity of that market. The data's not there. The products that exist today quite often aren't the products that those farmers need to tap into to get the financing. For instance, um, the Cura program right now, the basic Cura program with the subsidized program, what it requires for loans of, I think, above 150 million uh, 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 rupiah, it requires formal land titles. Um, I mentioned that we had gone out and looked at, at smallholder farmers around Indonesia or smallholder oil palm farmers around Indonesia. And, you know, there's not a whole lot of them that have those, far, those uh, formal titles. Um, independent smallholders are the fastest growing part of the growth in oil palm development in Indonesia. We look at it, uh, our, our, our numbers say that something like 70 to 80 percent of those independent smallholders don't have the kind of land titles that would allow them to get the most basic working capital loans. So when you're starting to talk about longer term replanting or peatland restoration loans, it's ways off. Um, interest rates, we have people come to us all the time talking about how high the interest rates are. But the, the, the problem isn't the interest rates so much. The problem is the product's not right. The timing of the repayments aren't right. Um, the security that, that farmers have to provide aren't right. The bank branch locations aren't in the right place. So um, when we've worked with especially private sector commercial banks, they just haven't seen the opportunities there. And what our role has been is to really show them that there are opportunities there. Maybe it's not all three and a half million independent smallholders in this country, but maybe there's some portion. And what we're focused on through the work that we're doing is trying to segment these markets and show banks and show companies that there are reliable borrowers, there are reliable partners out there. Um, so that's one area, the, the, you know, the products are just wrong. Um, another one is, as I mentioned, the banks don't see the opportunity, especially the private commercial banks. You know, the state-owned enterprise banks, they do. Um, they're lending somewhat through the core program, but that program's not big enough, and it's not going to probably uh, be around forever um, with a subsidy. You need to somehow get in the private capital. Um, and until you have the right products, until the banks see that opportunity, it, it's not going to be there. But even once you have that, what you don't have often is access to the farmers. So you have farmers in the plasma schemes that are in formal cooperatives, but you have independent smallholders uh, in oil palm that aren't in any formal cooperative. So how do you reach them? What we've focused on is working with farmer groups and developing the capacity of farmer groups to manage an internal control system. And that internal control system um, would deal with the sustainability of the production, but also with the business management, the business aspects of that farmer's group. And, you know, right now, those three conditions aren't there. The right products, um, the banks, and the companies seeing that there is a good opportunity to work with independent smallholders, and uh, the last point, which I've forgotten, I'm sorry, and the access through the farmer groups. So those are three big areas that, that we feel we, we're working on and that I see need to be addressed before you get broad access to smallholders, oil palm smallholders, and are able to look at the longer term financing that they need. Agus here is chomping at the bit to comment. Thank you for bringing up the, the financing for smallholders. I think that the biggest obstacle, we, I've been in, in discussions with various banks on this subject for two years, and we were not able to get financing from uh, real banks 
because we got two projects ongoing, one with the Revit Boon and the other one is with the BPDP Sawit, with the CPO fund, but not with the real bank uh, supports. The biggest challenge is that all of the banks that I've talked to, I'm sure there are many others that I have not, are only able to produce interest rates at the almost going rate or slightly less than going rate, which is around 11, 12 percent. But the farmers, because of the long, uh, because of the nature of the plantation, needs uh, an interest rate less than 10 percent. So that, that's why the idea of core coming into uh, the mix. But the, the essence of the problem is how can we reduce the risk so that the interest rate can be less, so that it is affordable. And, and I think uh, IFC and perhaps the, the government can also come up with some solution to bring down the interest rate to a for an affordable level. Or Erwin, can I ask you a question here? As someone who works on the sort of public-private partnership um, realm, so kind of bridging between both both government and private sector, can you can you talk a bit about your experience so far in trying to to, to work it that way, bringing the different parts together? What you see as a as the real, the real niche uh, in which organizations like yours can try to bridge this, this gap. Thanks. Thank you, AJ. Um, sometimes we feel like this country is divided into three divisions uh, or groups, uh, governments, uh, privates, and also social, uh, civil society, although all of them uh, confess themselves that they are actually a citizen as well. <laughs> but um, it seems that uh, communications here and to make them really sit together is the most important things that we have to start. That is a very technical thing that I believe everybody has already know about that. But uh, behind that, we need to have at least some agreements and in the very technical things. What I understand here, uh, that I've been like almost 10 years working with, uh, I mean to communicate between the government, uh, privates and uh, civil society, is to at least agree with four things. One is um, a spatial plan, the exact map, the exact area, the area that has been uh, conserved and obligated for or obligated for the uh, development. Even until now, we don't really have uh, the, the most agreed or even maybe still in the process of agreement between the companies with the uh, government, even among the government itself, uh, to agree on what one map policy has not been really uh, declared that we have one map. Uh, if we have that, I believe that we will have the more uh, liberty uh, to really conserve some area and then to make sure that the area for the no-go zone area do not be attached. So we can have a freedom to develop in the area that has not been, that is not been conserved at least to avoid the uh, conflicts and other, but we can, we can go fast on that. So this is actually how we are really encouraging that if we have an information on the real map that uh, we have, and then we can agree between the governments and the privates supported by the civil society, and I believe this will be a very great tool, or even the big bang for Indonesians to really start with uh, 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 the next programs. Because we believe that there are a lot of funding resources, even, even from the government or even for internationals. But uh, if you want to invest, you have to make sure that where you can invest, how many hectares you can invest, uh, how many hectares is, can has been really uh, obligated or provided for the conservations or for the restorations, etc., like that. So um, we have uh, one map policy, and now is how to we can cont uh, contribute 
because uh, you know that some of the area has been given as a permit into the companies and some company some of them has a very big area and then uh, they even from the process of from start uh, start with the permit they already have all the information on the area very detailed even the numbers of trees in that so if we can contribute contribute with that i believe uh, the investor or the investment uh, will be more than happy to really work in the area where they can invest size and then the the, the area the place and secondly is after we have the exact area based on the spatial plan and then we have agree on the borders and lines uh, we usually we, we will need a kind of the valuations uh, methodology we have several uh, evolutions of that from the CCB and then uh, VCS now we have a carbon a high carbon uh, stock uh, approach and then but I Kindi was just mentioned that maybe we have to make at least one or maybe several that has been agreed uh, into the national standards so that the government can support can can adopt and then can could could be agree on that and then the the value of the size of the area or the carbons of the bio or the biodiversity that has been value valued for that can be uh, come like a number that the, com the the investor can come into that. And once after that, again, we need the uh, support from the government. Uh, we have many seminars, conferences in the national or international level but unfortunately that uh, most of this information has not been really goes into the sub-national level especially now the kabupaten uh, with uh, this uh, uh, the, 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 the most of the programs uh, authorizations now in the kabupaten level the governance level too in the area and they are actually the owners of the area especially the non-forested area so this is what we have to agree that we have the support because sometimes we have the permit from the national level, but the local government does not even know. So there will be a kind of potential conflict, and usually investor doesn't like this kind of uh, uh, program, uh, uh, situations. And after that, is to make sure that the financing uh, will come after that. But still, even now, uh, we only uh, knew some of the bigger uh, potential financing assisted in Indonesia. When we have the GCF Global Climate Fund, and then previously we have Adaptations Fund, and now we are in the surrounding uh, sounds of the Biocarbon uh, Facilities Fund, but uh, we don't really have the database of the potential service provider or the uh, uh, fund administrators that can. Uh, has a potential, especially the accredited uh, entity that can work on that in Indonesia. Lucky we have some uh, existing uh, institutions, but mostly NGO like uh, Kahati, for example, partnerships, and LCTF like a hybrid between the government and also the uh, uh, social civil society. But uh, in the same in the same times, we also need to have. Uh, the more complete information and data mapping on the potential investor or financing institutions that can support in Indonesia. And even until now, we don't have the agenda, like a calendar of who are, who are the potential contributor for this year or the, to the next five years, like that. Uh, but we don't have to set about that because this is the reality. Our, our task is actually to start to move to really uh, move, put on all the puzzles that we have and I believe that uh, the gentleman in the right place here <laughs> we might have some more information that how we can start to integrate with that because but I believe that once we have the the map the the area the size of hectares and then the valuations of that and the support of the the, the governments uh, although now we have already some partial uh, support 
and a facilitation system, but I believe if this can be more integrated and it can be like a big uh, potential that we can support for the reduce emissions and then deforestations. And one thing that we are actually like until now is about the pit support, our support for the pit area. It's uh, the most uh, potential area that would be emitting a lot of uh, carbons if we don't preserve. But uh, beside of that, we are actually happy because we have one of the biggest pit, one of five biggest pit in the world. And I heard that is sexy for the donors. So <laughs> why don't we work on that? Yeah? We have some super doom that, that we call in Indonesia. So. That's actually a perfect segue. How sexy is it for the donors, Christopher? Please tell us. How do you see, how do you see the money that's on the table from Norway and from other donors being used most effectively in this space? What realistically should it, can it finance? What should it finance? And how can it play the most effective role? Please. Was that all your questions? You can pick, just, you can pick one. No, first of all, I, I, I don't know, but I, I'm pretty sure that most of my friends back home would find it really strange that so many people showed up to discuss Pete. Um, but I, I, and this is really encouraging, the, the, the messages that we hear both from, from the private sector and the government. I think that is really encouraging, and I think we can find solutions to this. And I'm very tempted to dive into the discussions both on smallholders now and, and, uh, and also on one map. But I'll try first to, to go on the, on, on the larger picture, because if we, if we look into this in the long term, uh, restoring landscapes and, and peat uh, will be beneficial. I mean, research shows that uh, if you add the value of the water or the ecosystem services, we're talking about food, we're talking about clean water, we're talking about clean air, we're talking about people's health. Uh, the benefits are larger than the costs in the long run. But of course, that is difficult to, to, to it's difficult to base the decisions and the, the systems on that when most of us only think for the next five years instead of the next five generations. Uh, but in the long run, this should be possible. And we as donors, we have lots of responsibilities. If, if we should see, look at the short term, I know that on the international level, there are funds available for, for landscape restoration that is not being spent because uh, it's, no one has been able to match those funds with eligible projects. Uh, and in a country where there is a lot of peat and a lot of uh, peat that needs restoration, I think maybe in the short term, uh, someone who is responsible here should look at this. How can we fast track some of these funds to Indonesia? But at the same time, we as donors, we love our own, we love our own funds and we love our own initiatives and our own projects. And every time our politicians go to international conferences, they establish something new. So I can perfectly understand that it's difficult to, 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 to maneuver in this field. Uh, and, and here lies a responsibility for us also, together with all the other actors, to try to coordinate. Um, what is our role as, uh, as a donor and how can we contribute? I think um, given the, the long-term potential uh, profits of having sustainable landscape, landscapes, um, we can support in the transformation period. Um, from, from the Norwegian side, we prefer to do this through results-based payments. I know that some of the people in this room might think that red is dead. Uh, we don't think so. We see a lot of good results in, in, in different regions of the world. Um, very encouraging results. And we think Indonesia is very much on the right way as well. It may, it may, be, it may have been less publicly uh, visible, but uh, I've, we strongly believe that Indonesia is moving in the right direction. So can we, can we provide in addition to the results-based payments? Well, we are... Um, uh, providing technical support, technical assistance through a number of, of partners here in Indonesia. I am so lucky that I get to follow uh, the work that the South Sumatra uh, governor and province uh, are doing together with uh, the UK Climate Change Unit and their partners, uh, a consortium led by the Zoological Society London. Uh, and they are working on this on landscape level. And we as a donor, we, that, is, that is sexy and attractive to us. Uh, we have been here for a while, and for us, the, the big value is not so much the small pilot projects anymore. We want to have a landscape approach, and we want to have a jurisdictional approach. 
it has not so much value for us to provide a lot of funds for reduced emissions in 20 hectares in South Sumatra if we see that all the reduced emissions are absorbed by huge growth in emissions in other provinces. So, so this is why we're looking at Indonesia as a whole, but we have stepped it up from the districts and, uh, districts and pilots to the provinces, and, and we see that Indonesia is following. And there is a lot of, of, of these projects going on. We're also working with uh, East Kalimantan and their cooperation with the World Bank and the Global Green Growth Institute, and we see similar stepping up of the work there. Uh, and we see all of this in many parts of the, of, of the country. Um, I'll be quick, but so in addition to the 800 billion hanging there, which we hope will be channeled through a fund established by Indonesian government in a way that it triggers more and more emission reductions uh, through better and better uh, sustainable landscape management, uh, we can also support uh, through the, or the global mechanisms like the, the biocarbon fund and then the, the other funds in the World Bank, for example. Uh, so we are trying to trigger, we're trying to push in the right direction, but the big, big work has to be done by the Indonesian side. And, and in the long run, Indonesia will certainly uh, make profit of that. Uh, thanks, A.G. Yes, I would like to respond on this, some of the discussion that is being uh, 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 taking place. Well, in terms of the Indonesian government, I think, uh, well, we are already finished uh, uh, drafting the uh, presidential decree for the BLU uh, environmental funds. Um, this will be like the, uh, uh, the, the umbrella of the uh, mobilization of the uh, environmental funds. Because uh, all this time, maybe you, you are aware of some of the BLU that has not been very successful in mobilizing their funds. Let's say the, the, the forest uh, BLU, forest BLU, they got like about 10 trillion stuck there. And there are other issues, mainly because of the uh, grant making mechanisms that hasn't been uh, otherwise uh, 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 regulated. Well, with this uh, President decree, we, we are uh, 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 able to, to mobilize these funds, yet we are still waiting for the instruments for the in, uh, economic instrument for the environment uh, regulations to be, uh, uh, to be uh, 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 acted, yeah, enacted. Uh, with that regard, I think uh, once it's uh, uh, operational, Pak uh, Punki, I think the government will be able to, to invest on the uh, seed funding because uh, the, the beauty of the BLU or the uh, uh, social uh, 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 services body, that it, it itself can operate uh, multi years, where the budget, government budget only operate within uh, one year and so, and it have to re replenish afterwards, yeah. And uh, we, with this, I think we hope that we can really mobilize and also uh, try to synergize between uh, the funds that government already established, like for instance, as you say, the BPDP Sawit, Pak, yeah. I'm aware of the, of the hesitation from the B, uh, BRI, Pak, yeah, Bank Rakyat Indonesia and stuff, because I talk to them as well. <laughs> I understand <laughs> from the, in terms of the business point of view, Pak, yeah. Well, yeah, once we have this uh, 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 BLU, I think we'll be able to mobilize that. Not only domestically, but also uh, international. Like for instance, the Green Climate Fund that Pak uh, Erwin just mentioned about, uh, it only happens that uh, my office, the Fiscal Policy Agency, has also been uh, appointed as the national authority of the Green Climate Funds. Well, if you uh, really calculate the parameters uh, for Indonesia, then uh, we calculate uh, that in our, uh, uh, internally that Indonesia might be eligible for about 2.8 billion US dollars per year out of green climate funds. Where about half of it is in grants for adaptation purposes. Yes, that's why the, the grant uh, making mechanism is really something that I think is timely uh, or, it's, or maybe due uh, to be uh, regulated, I think, soon, yeah. So I think uh, with that, Edwin, I think we also uh, facing uh, some challenges. Most of the challenges with the operational of the GCF is in terms of project development. Yes, you are right. Not only to find the landscape, but 
also to to uh, build the whole project. Like for instance, the in terms of the uh, 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 social interactions and then gender uh, uh, policies, there is this, you know I think we still really need to develop uh, in Indonesia. So I think with this, I think I already uh, uh, I respond to some of the discussion. Ag, thanks. I want to make sure we have some time for questions from the audience, but I, I just want to ask a question back to my private sector colleagues, if I may. Um, can maybe it would, be, it would be interesting to hear from from your side what you think would be the most useful to have from government and donors <laughs> to really facilitate this sort of large scale private sector investment. Um, Smallholders, one bit, but not just smallholders. Also, interesting to hear a bit more specifically, like the middle tier of a lot of this oil palm industry, which is where a lot of the action is happening. Um, what do you think? What, what, what would you What would you ask our partners for? IFC first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, somebody brought up landscapes, and I think that I, I don't think I know. I, I, I know that the landscapes. Uh, uh, approach uh, the the initiatives. Um, if you take a step back, one of the reasons that private sector hasn't invested in, say, independent smallholders is because when they invest in that supply chain, there's as good a chance that it's going to go off to somebody else as as to them. So to them, the the advantage of investing in that su supply chain, where they are procuring from independent smallholders, is kind of limited. So what some of the companies have done is talk together, work together, but what they find when they talk together and work together is they're accused of collusion in many cases. But the landscape approach um, kind of allows them to work together, maybe in a province, maybe in a whole supply shed, maybe in several jurisdictions, but companies that, that we talk to are concerned that them coming together and trying these kind of initiatives uh, runs afoul of some of the Indonesian uh, uh, concerns with collusion, with corruption, and everything else. So, um, you know, is it a is it a policy? I don't know if it's a policy. Is it a is it a close look at at the regulations that are on the book to see what's prohibiting private sector participants? Not all of them. I mean, some of them don't want to come together. But there are a good share of companies that want to do the right thing or trying to do the right thing and are kind of prohibited from moving forward because of their fear of corruption or collusion charges from the government. Um, so the landscape's approach, as you guys, uh, as you very smart people that work at the policy level are advancing it, keep that in mind that there are things right now that are keeping private sector participants from participating in it. That's one thing. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hmm. I'm. A, I have a difficulty to answer because I, the answers can can go a number of ways. I think I'm. I'm in agreement with all the the right stuff of uh, got to be transparent, accountable, uh, no corruptions and whatnot. But it's also a problem when we are. Uh, too busy in creating the safeguards, if I may use the term, uh, b because we should not make the perfect to be the obstacles of doing concrete things. And and there is where we need the, the courage. And I've seen that a lot in the present administration, that the government is willing to take the first risk. Uh, sometimes the company is also willing to take the first risk. And if there's a loss, then the company is willing to absorb the first loss, for example. But uh, let's define that. Let's make it concrete, make it possible. Yes, there are regulations that are not in place, but can we give it a label of pilot projects, of testing? But because the, the, the problem that we are facing is, aside from the reality of those problem of safeguards, there is also this perception problem. Perceptions of high risk, perceptions of, oh, it will be corrupted, cynical perceptions that can only be countered by successful pilot activities. So my, my suggestion is let's go concrete with a short term of uh, pilot activities, short time frame, concrete investment, and then build confidence so that we, we could have more and more uh, players interested in it. Okay, quite 
interesting. Thanks so much. So maybe let me turn out to the, I see hand goes up, boom. Okay, please, um, let's, let's um, turn in the back. Yeah, who's, who's, please. Back here, please. Oh, hi, that's you. Wanna, should we pass a, pass a microphone? How about that? Maybe I could ask um, here. I'll pass this to you. And then we'll, thank you so much. You want to take a few, or you want? Let's see if we can get a few people. AJ, um, yeah. may people uh, mention who they are and from what organization? Thank you. My name is Nur Hidayate. I'm from Walhi. My question is to Ministry of uh, Finance. Um, are you looking at? Uh, carbon tax as the source of financing for the uh, efforts to reduce the emission in Indonesia? If not, why? And if yes, is it uh, on what is happening uh, it, at what stage current, uh, the current development? Thank you. Shall I start? I've been, in, I've been doing social and economic research in Indonesia for the last 50 years with many different organizations, including evaluation studies of World Bank projects and, and transmigration areas and so on, all of which failed, by the way. But what I'd like to ask is, what is a smallholder? It, it seems that you can, it seems like from what I've read, a smallholder in your mind is 50 hectares or more. In my mind, it's two hectares, and there's a huge difference. Also, now there's supposed to be a moratorium on opening new lands for oil palm, and so new, for opening uh, lands in uh, tidal swamp areas and peatlands. But you're f providing funds for small holders who are really rather large holders and even one small holder actually had 2,000 hectares but only had opened 50 hectares. So how do you handle loans in some of these areas and speak about small holders when really for Indonesians, I taught at Ipe Bay for 12 years Indonesians think of a smallholder as two hectares, but we're talking about 50 hectares. I think that's a large landholder. Thank you. Can you, sorry, sir, what's your, your name, please? Excuse me? Your name? Uh, Bill Collier, William L. Collier. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. I came here in 1968 with the John D. Rockefeller Foundation, doing research at Ipe Bay and all. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so why don't we take the a first set of questions. I appreciate that. Um, maybe we, a couple, I guess we can maybe start as they came in. Uh, I guess it's for you uh, from Paenda. Okay. So one of the programs that the IFC is working with is... Go ahead, go ahead, sorry. I was just, yeah. just, yeah, please go. Yes, please, go. No, no, sorry. So one of the programs that IFC is working with is with OJ Cop. I'm sorry. Uh, on uh, uh, working with, with OJ Ka to introduce some criteria around some of what I guess OJ Ka would say are uh, sensitive sectors. This is, this is uh, one of our advisory programs. It, it's financed by, uh, um, uh, by the UK. And the, the program is helping banks in Indonesia, or OJ Ka, to work with banks in Indonesia to bring in some of that screening criteria. Now, has it got down to individual loans and individual banks? No. Has it got down to smallholders yet? No. There's work in progress. On the informal side, companies that are seeking uh, sources of, of say, uh, no deforestation, no peat, no exploitation, kind of FFB from smallholders are 
entering into agreements with banks, some of the banks that do lend, some of the core programs perhaps, and saying, look, we'll be willing to uh, offer a, a firm commitment to purchase that FFB, but we need to know from where it comes. And one, we don't want it from Pete, we don't want it, uh, well, you know, it's gotta fit whatever criteria we have on the NDPE stuff. So is it official yet? No. Are banks, do I know of any banks that are screening that, using that screening criteria? No. But I do know of banks and companies that are entering into arrangements where the company is saying, we don't want this stuff. We don't want this stuff in our supply chain. We've made our own commitments. We don't want it coming in just because they're smallholders, and we will only accept what comes in if it's financed by you. We'll only give a guarantee that we'll purchase it if we know where it comes from, and it can't come from here, here, or here, or under these conditions. So nothing on the formal side, in development on the formal side, but on the, the informal side, companies are making these arrangements with those lenders that are out there. Do you also want to maybe speak a little bit about this definition of smallholder? Me? We're not lending to smallholders. Okay. So if uh, I, I I thought that was for. No, I'm just just, just asking questions. The definition of. Oh, our definition yeah, yeah, of smallholder, um, in the program that we're working in, two three hectares, um, fifty hectares would be a pretty darn big smallholder. Um, I think under the uh, RSPO guidelines, I think it could be fifty hectares and still be. Uh, a smallholder, but independent smallholders that, that we tend to work with are in that two, three hectare area. I'm sure there's larger ones. I know there's larger ones, but uh, two, three hectares. Thanks. So maybe we can pass back, Kindy, if you could talk a little bit. I mean, you might start also with the definition of smallholders. That's something that you're working on. I know that ISPO, I think, says 20 hectares or less. I mean, different agencies obviously have different definitions for this. That's part of the challenge. Um, and that's part of what, what I'm sure is, is, um, is, is, is being discussed and addressed in many ways. But if you could speak a bit, a bit about that and then about the carbon tax, which I think is. Uh, right. Oh, thanks. Oh, yeah, the definitions that has been uh, 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 terms by the uh, Ministry of Agriculture for the small holders, I think it's about 20 uh, hectares uh, uh, holders here. Yeah. Well, I think with that, we got, uh, we need to, uh, yeah. we need to inter take into account the uh, level of the uh, uh, investment, the operating cost that has been uh, uh, put into the uh, operational. So I think that was also defined. And despite that, we also need to take into account the number of the labor uh, work at the uh, uh, estate. That's also one of the uh, definition uh, from the Ministry of the Agriculture. That's what I understand out of the uh, terms here. Yeah. And if I may go to the uh, carbon tax, uh, yes, we have uh, been studying the uh, carbon tax uh, ever since 2009, back uh, after Copenhagen. Uh, uh, there, are, there, are, there are two, uh, two uh, considerations that we've been taking into account. First is on the international reciprocity. Uh, the carbon uh, 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 abatement cost, if you like, differ from country to countries. Like for instance, uh, in Indonesia, I think if you take average, maybe it costs about like, uh, I think now it's about, I think about uh, 20 uh, uh, US dollars, let's say per uh, tons of uh, equivalent CO2. But maybe in Japan it costs about 100 something uh, dollars per, per uh, tons of CO2 because of their uh, industrial uh, content. So with this, the reciprocity is quite uh, difficult. And uh, the other uh, uh, consideration is also uh, on the uh, law. The tax law in Indonesia specify the tax revenue only for uh, deficit financing, not uh, earmarked for environment as what it is described or defined for uh, carbon tax yet. Uh, without knowing, uh, maybe you already pay the carbon levy. So levy is allowed in Indonesia, for instance, for uh, uh, carbon tax. So it's carbon levy in Indonesia. 
there is about 5% of uh, 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 levy in every liter of uh, fuel that you pay at the gas station. So that's already carbon tax, uh, carbon levy, sorry, without you knowing that. And I think uh, this has uh, been uh, exercised carefully. Maybe you remember last year or, or two years ago when uh, the former minister Sudirman Said about to introduce the, uh, uh, the fuel charges as well. But I think that's also one of the discussion back then. Yeah. But again, the international reciprocity, uh, reciprocity is one of the uh, I think main concern. But levy, I think, is a lot. But I think the introduction of the five percent uh, levy on the uh, 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 fuels that you pay at the gas station already uh, been one of the uh, 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 use of carbon tax in Indonesia. Uh, back to you, AJ. Thanks. Thanks so much. On the smallholders, I we follow the. Uh, directions of the Ministry of Agriculture. It's about two hectares. The, the problem with that definition, it's very rigid. If it's one hectare, it doesn't comply. If it's two and a half hectares, it also doesn't comply. It has to be exactly two hectares. <laughs> so that is one of the headache of using fun uh, from the government. But uh, just to follow up a bit, if the company has a land of about 80 hectares, actually they can borrow money from the bank they have the financial ability to borrow money from the bank without the special rate of the government. So I think when we talk about replanting scheme and uh, the need for a interest rate less than 10%, that should only be intended for the real smallholder, which is around two hectares. Those that are bigger, they can uh, use the 12.5% interest rate. Thank you. So let's see if we have a, a few more questions. I know Mike has one. I'll go to Tim. Okay, just stay right here. Thank you, AJ, and thanks to the, to the panelists. I'm Mikael Buki from the uh, European Union delegation in uh, Jakarta. Uh, my question uh, goes to uh, Pak Agus. Um, you mentioned the uh, assessment and mapping of, of risk for public and private investments uh, to, to cause or to aggravate uh, deforestation or, or peatland degradation. And I, I, I think you're very right, it's, it's central. If, if those assessments were deemed trustworthy uh, by investors, by uh, donors and so on, that, that will be a huge step forward. Um, and in, in that context, I, that brings to my mind two questions. One is how comprehensive, how detailed need the risk assessment to be? Um, you, you could imagine many dimensions of, of, uh, of that risk, social, economic, environmental, uh, sustainable in a, in a very broad sense. At the same time, it needs to be simple enough to be effective to inform decision making. Uh, so wha where, where is the, the right, the sweet, the sweet spot between those two extremes of being very dumb but uh, effective or, or being very detailed and comprehensive? And the other question is, uh, what is the good scale for such a mapping? You, you could map it at the level of uh, plantation, of a uh, smaller farm, uh, a district, a landscape, a uh, region. Um, and where you do the mapping, what's the scale of the mapping as a direct bearing or where do you apply pressure, be it market pressure or policy pressure? So what, what's at which level basically should we try, once we have such an assessment, once we are agree on the criteria and, 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 and comprehensiveness of the, of the data collection, where do we apply the pressure? What is the right scale to make that assessment? <coughs> My name is Timothy Jessup. I'm with the Global Green Growth Institute in Indonesia. And my question is for anyone, but uh, uh, both public and private sectors, and it's about how do we differentiate the responsibility of public and private investment, specifically in the hydrological rehabilitation of degraded peatlands. So I'm talking about the engineering, canal blocking, canal infilling, because this is an absolutely crucial part of restoration. And uh, very briefly, an argu argument could be made that should be driven by public investment, because we're talking about public goods and services, as Christopher said, for the long-term benefit of society. But a counter-argument could be made that uh, particularly for large private companies that have a history on the land, they have lo their long-term concession holders, they've benefited from this peatland, they should take the lead in financing this uh, rather expensive and um, important intervention. So um, I wonder if we could talk a bit about that. Where is that money coming from? Who should be in charge of it? And who determines how it's spent and where? Thank you. 
um, Lahiru from the National University of Singapore. The question is to the Norwegian Embassy and the Ministry of Finance. It's mainly about Red Plus funding. Uh, your explanation on why the money is given on for an entire country is a logical one, but Indonesia is huge. It's the size of Europe, and it's very diverse. And it's a, um, by doing so, there's some places in the country which are clearly performing really well, and they are not being rewarded. And it's been seven years now since the project has started. Right, a good example is Aceh. They put the forest aside. Um, the money never came, and they put a spatial plan which was said that they're going to cut everything down. Um, maybe now, because the Ministry of Finance mentioned different funding mechanisms where they can divert it to provinces, what about, isn't that an option that you can actually reward the people who are performing if you wait for an entire country the size of Europe with a population probably the size of Europe scattered on such a big place to perform? Isn't that unreasonable because they have a lot of other pressures other than just carbon? Okay, so with that, we only have about 10 minutes left right here, so I think we're going to have to be... Um, I'm going to ask my, the responses to be quite targeted. Um, maybe we can start then with Pak Agu since that first came to you about sort of risk and scale. <laughs> maybe we can start with that, please. Uh, I, what I would like to caution in, in answering to the uh, question is that we should not go into a more complicated and difficult uh, preparation works. Life has been too difficult enough Let's make it simple. Uh, in terms of risk assessment, there is already uh, a method that is acceptable in the market. Uh, you go to the market, you know the country risk of Indonesia compared to other countries, the, the sector risk and whatnot. So if we just use that, and then we discuss with the financial players on how can we reduce further that risk. Uh, that is the most, the fastest way and that can only be done with the government coordinating the discussion, and especially the OJK and others who will then, okay, if that is your biggest worry, government will do this policy. Can we go, will that mean reductions? Yes, so then that's hopefully the fastest way to do. The, on the second of the scale, I think what we need is to have a scale that people can be held accountable to. Uh, what is it? If, if it's the, the authority at the level of the district, then district should be the maximum boundary. If it's beyond districts, then how are we going to manage it? Can we split it? And so uh, making it doable, making it chewable is the, the key. Uh, there are many small patches of peatland that are also need to be safe, not only the big, fast uh, track of peatlands. In fact, in, in many of the plantations, the peatland is like our fingers, uh, in between fingers are mineral lands. So the complication in dealing with finger type of peatland also need to be addressed. And that is on the size where it can still be managed effectively. Do you want to also maybe come back very quickly on Tim's question about sort of responsibility for uh, public and private investment? And I'll, ask, I'll ask all of us. I, to I to think on, on, on Tim question, uh, we need to have an extra exactly, session outside. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't. One minute to answer. I haven't that. talked with Tim for two <laughs> decades. So uh, basically, there shouldn't be any iron rule of a division of labor mm -hmm. because a lot of it can be shared. But what important for private sector is to be assured that the government is in it, that the government has ownership so that we will also own part of the issue, part of the challenge. So uh, we can do some upfront if the government will need a parliamentary approval, but we need to be assured that by the time they got the approval, then their part of contributions will go into. So it's, it's just agreeing to an area that both are quite confirmed, quite, quite assured that they can deliver. And this is, unfortunately, has to be long term. And government is only every five years, right? And the budget is every year. So we need to be clever. And I think Minister of Finance have been working on ways with their uh, BLU concepts and others so that they can commit to a rather long term. And let's sit and define the works. And then uh, some of it will require government because it's by nature it has to be government. Some of it can be uh, given to the private sector, and we will take uh, the, the challenge if uh, the commitment is as strong as, as uh, needed. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Aiki. 
Well, with respond to uh, Timothy's uh, 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 ideas, I think I would also like to uh, 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 challenge that statement of being uh, public goods, because once there is an uh, there is the right attached to the goods, then it turns into uh, either uh, club goods or into the private goods. So when it turns into either uh, other than the uh, 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 public goods, then all the uh, uh, publics uh, or the uh, uh, governance, if you like, also attached to the, the rights. Yeah. And I think uh, uh, the government still have uh, their uh, responsibility in that case to uh, ensure the public safety uh, by means of uh, establishing the uh, rule of law and then ways to uh, enforce the rule of law. And also by uh, 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 putting in place the accountability and transparency for all the publics to be able to uh, monitor the, uh, the, the compliance of the rules of law. So I think <laughs> that's my, my, my opinion. But again, but Agus is right. In the uh, draft of the uh, government regulation of the instrument for economic instrument for the inf environment, uh, there is a, a fund to be uh, to be managed that will be able to uh, to uh, uh, do the first move yeah, of the government in terms of the emergencies, and that will also be able uh, the government to uh, take the long term investment in terms of those uh, necessar necessity uh, uh, by the establishment of the BLU. So back to you again, thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Pat Erwin, do you want to come in here? Just to add to make kind of a bit of confirmation that we already have. Government support has already been there and they have, they have been working hard to create at least a kind of umbrella for, uh, to pull some financial support into some pro, uh, inform, uh, important area. For example, like uh, the presidential decree 13, number two, for the Rimba Corridor, Kawasan Management Riau Jambi, Sumatra, uh, Riau Jambi and Sumatra Barat. Rimba is an acronym for the three provinces. And then Heart of Borneo, the two areas has been uh, what we call KSN, Kawasan Strategic National, that APBN, the National uh, Budgetary System, are supposed to be uh, involved uh, to make a protections of those area. And then the Papua Low Development Carbons, uh, Papua Low Carbon Development Programs, that will go into the presidential decree as well. It's been ten years actually in the processes, but. Hopefully, it can be a kind of area that will have the, an umbrella so that the investment uh, can come. Because uh, this, this area, uh, the, this, these regulations or the President's decree was established based on the, a spatial plan. Where the area you can protect, where the area you can develop, uh, something like that. Uh, each of them consisted at least like five million, hec uh, five million hectares in Sumatra, Kalimantan, and in and Papua. Unfortunately, uh, that size of area is not small. <coughs> and then government budgetary system are not be able to cover everything. So this is the reasons why we have to encourage the private uh, partnerships uh, to be involved in these programs. There are some companies that have at least like uh, one million hectares that has been uh, committed to contribute into these programs to create what we call a landscape, uh, conservations, rehabilitations, and enrichments into the uh, social and uh, economic for the community activities. And those area, fortunately, are in the Rimba Corridor, in Heart of Borneo Corridor, and the Papua Low Carbon Development Programs. Uh, after we have three, we hope that we will expand from the Central Sumatra Rimba Corridors, uh, Kawasan Management Rimba Corridors, into the northern, northern part. Unfortunately, we have not found the good acronyms for that. Kawasan Management Sumatra Utara and Aceh. So it could be like Kamasutra. <laughs> and then the low, 
uh, and then uh, for Rimba, we will we will uh, expand the area into Sumatra Selatan. But uh, Rimba acronym will be like Kama Setan okay. or something <laughs> like that. And then Bukit, uh, Bengkulu and uh, Lampung is uh, okay. Bukit Barisan, so it's like a Bubar Corridor. But uh, gentlemen, um, involvement of the private private uh, facilitations is now become like a, like a, like a, a fashion that the international or the UNFCCC uh, accredited institutions like Global Climate Fund, Adaptations Fund, and also the uh, biocarbons to have a co-financing uh, facilitation from the private company as well. So not just like uh, landscape approach and jurisdictions approach that we will encourage the investment into the uh, landscape, especially for the area, but also financial uh, approach. Uh, then the financial will approach, hopefully. Right. That's a kind of an announcement, actually, that we have to go fo forward for that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so since it, we're now at 3.31 and we're supposed to be over, I, I just want to quickly give some words that I heard. This is such a fascinating subject. There's so much to say. It's great to have this illustrious panel right here. But clearly, what I come away with is that basically there's a lot of money on the table and the question is really how to use it and redirect it and use it as most effectively possible. And I think there's a lot of really good ideas uh, and now's the time to get to work and really pilot and show what can be done to make that happen. Um, government is thinking hard about how to use new instruments. There were a number mentioned. That's an area where there needs to be a lot of work. Obviously, the World Bank, I can say we're happy to sit work with you in ways that we can try and move some of those really good ideas forward. The BELU, DECA, PES, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what's in it for the companies? That has to be first in, on the table, right? Nobody invests in something that doesn't make sense, right? So finding ways to de-risk in terms of timing, prediction, risk, et cetera, are, are critical elements. Uh, Smallholders, that's like a whole separate section. We get a day on that next week. <laughs> but fascinating, important challenges to financing. Um, donors want to use their money uh, to finance largely a transition. So this is this about how to use that money to really leverage that transition and then be able to step away in large part. And I think that's, a, that's it's not about donors providing large scale financing to this sector for the end of time. Um, and so government needs to really show leadership as they are, confirm their role, play the role, and really set the rules, right? That's something that we're all happy to participate in. So with that, I want to please join me in saying thank you to this fantastic panel. Thank you for spending time. <laughs> and, and thank you all for making Pete sexy. Yeah. <laughs>